Neil on leveraging a decision quality approach for strategic optionality. Amalia leads SCA's business advisory services, including those related to asset value optimization, organizational efficiency, non-operator influence, strategy, and transformation. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographic audience. And so I launched a poll for the audience. You should see what is your primary discipline? We're starting to get some responses now. Looks like we have quite a few petroleum engineers in the audience, as well as some geoscientists. People are still voting. Looks like most of you have voted and I will close that poll and share the results. We have 56% petroleum engineers, 44% geoscientists. So let's go on to the next question. How many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? Just trying to get some responses. I see several of you have over 30 years of experience, quite a few in the 11 to 20 year bracket. And most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. We have 56% with over 30 years experience, 22% respectively in the 21 to 30 year and the 11 to 20 year range. So good distribution. All of you have some experience. So let me go back to sharing my slides. So before I introduce Dr. Olivera Riley and Dr. Neal, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted, but you may ask questions during the presentation using the go to webinar question feature. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation and you will be anonymous. Today's talk is leveraging a decision quality approach for strategic optionality. And our first speaker is Dr. Jack Neal. And Jack has been consulting for several years after recently retiring from ExxonMobil. He's currently the president of the Houston chapter of the Society of Decision Professionals, SDP. And uh, at Exxon, he led the strategy and decision quality scenario workshops on MCPs. And he also mentored and trained on VOI, business acumen, and technical and commercial leadership. Jack has a BS in geology and geophysics from University of Tulsa and a PhD from Rice. He's co-authored several papers and co-edited a textbook on sequence stratigraphy. Dr. Olivera Riley, is an executive leader whose experience includes ExxonMobil, Repsol, and Tolo. Uh, she's been involved in leadership roles in a number of com companies uh, and utilized her strategic vision, technical, and organizational skills to design and implement change. Her experience spans five continents and more than 40 company countries in deep water, offshore, and onshore uh, unconventional environments. Amalia was on the World Energy so 2020 list of influential women in energy and she's been active in a number of forums and sat on the board of IAPG in Houston and was a board member for Lean In Equity and Sustainability. Amalia has a PhD in geoscience from Purdue. She has worked and lived in Houston, London and now resides in Madrid. She is originally from Argentina and speaks both Spanish and English fluently. Amalia leads SCA's business advisory services. So there are a number of topics that your company may be working on and Amalia can bring her hands-on extensive experience and bring in uh, high quality technical experts to help you with those efforts. So turn to SCA for business advisory services. We have several free webinars coming up in the next few months. Um, in November, we have Dr. Everton Arujo. He'll be speaking on the geomechanics of CCS, why, how, and when. 
And in December, we have Drs. Birol Dindaruk and Dr. Sylvia Levescu. They'll be speaking on geothermal energy that ties to their class by the same name. Uh, we have an upcoming live online class, which will be in later in October, uh, three mornings, October 24, 26, and 27. And this is using capacitance resistance modeling to manage mature oil fields. Drs. Larry Lake and Jerry Jensen will be leading that live online class. And of course, you can come to SCA for all your training needs. Uh, we can do in-house classes. You can attend our public classes, either in person or live online. And of course, we have field trips. So think about SCA for consulting, direct hire services, projects and studies, and training. And so I'm going to give the presentation rights over to Jack. Let's see, you should have the rights now. Okay. Looks good. All right, ready to go. Well, thanks for the introduction, Susan, and uh, everyone for, for joining us. Uh, we hope to have a, a good discussion, cover some cover some uh, some material here, and hope you have questions, and and uh, we'll be happy to answer those, I guess, at the end. But as we go through this, uh, please think about how you might be able to use decision quality in your work. So um, let's start with what we're going to try to cover today, um, providing some context, and then covering the elements of decision quality and how it gets implemented in project management. We'll look at the decision quality flow, which is uh, one of your key takeaways here is a, a, a simply frame, diverge, and converge way to think about problem solving and, and arriving at a, at a quality decision. We'll, we'll then pivot to uh, real world applications and competing decision metrics what some of the value drivers and uncertainties that you need to be considered as you approach a, a decision. And then the case studies that that where we use frame, diverge, and converge with the key takeaways. So as we open up a uh, discussion on decision quality and, and think about a guy who uh, I think everyone would agree, he's got pretty good business acumen and, and how he looks at, at decisions, Jeff Bezos, in a note to his shareholders, a letter in 2016, um, Jeff called out decision quality and decision making about a common pitfall in large organizations, one that hurts speed and invention and venomous is a one size fits all decision making. And to make that point, he had a two by two matrix here, which looks at whether decisions are reversible or irreversible and whether they're high or low consequence. In Jeff's framework, anything that's low consequence needs to be decided fast. Um, I guess the, the thinking is, if it's not that that consequential, let's just get on and don't waste too much time thinking about it. On things that have higher consequence with reversible or irreversible, high confidence, irreversible, make the decision slowly and carefully. And even though high confidence and are uh, decisions that are reversible, decide fast and then gather evidence about the outcome. One of the key uh, components to this, if you think about this upper upper half, these two quadrants, is really understanding your signposts and your mitigations. What do you what do you think could influence your decisions in the future? And if you think ahead, how might you avoid some of the losses or learn from those um, as you move forward, <clears throat> collecting that information? It's not not uncommon to think about this uh, great book that um, Daniel Kahneman put out that many people will know about, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, highlights how making decisions fast can be good sometimes. It really goes into cognitive biases. Um, you use this uh, system one versus system two. However, if you use system one, the, 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 the fast biased decisions on decisions that and problems that are more complicated, you'll get wrong answers. And we've seen a lot of that in, in the oil and gas industry um, using hog laws and, and, and uh, you know, a bias to action that leads to regretted decisions down the road. So while we don't wanna go slow, we wanna be thoughtful. And as we approach our decisions, we wanna engage 
both the analytical part of our mind and the creative part of our mind. And as we look at the opportunity space, um, don't just settle on a local maximum or minimum in the solution space. See if with a little bit more thinking, we can get to global uh, highs and lows and, and, and better answers than ones we get to faster. So to do that, as I mentioned, in, as Susan mentioned in my, uh, my introduction, I'm in the Society of Decision Professionals, and they espouse their practitioners who uh, specialize in a, a decision quality approach. Uh, the elements of decision quality are shown in this uh, circle of uh, linked chain that is something which grew out of the Stanford and Harvard business schools in the late 1960s. It also is a is a core for a uh, uh, an SPE paper that was published in in uh, 19 or uh, 2018, I guess, on um, decision quality with multi-company assets. Um, published there was what is known as the Decision Makers Bill of Rights. So if you think about this, what do you as a decision maker have the right to expect from your project team? Well, first and foremost, the decision frame. You know. What, how do you decide what, you're, what you are deciding? Um, it structures the decision in a context that's most relevant to meet your needs. From there, you want to diverge on creative alternatives that allow you to make a selection among viable and distinct choices, all that, that meet your framed question. With all those choices that are available if you, when you're in your creativity, now is the time to do analysis with relevant and reliable information and how will you base your decision with the analysis that follows of those choices with those choices um, we also need to think about the trade-offs and the potential consequences of each alternative based on what your decision metrics are um, what what are the things that are important to you as you make your decision and how are those how do those play out this is a time too to think about alternate scenarios and how the world ahead of us may play out and how these trade-offs may be more or less advantaged in, in alternate scenarios. And this is where the logical analysis allows you to draw some meaningful conclusions and reach clarity of action, which then follows with how will we take action? What is the, the effective facilitation to get that kind of alignment and then commit and move forward? So if we think about how decision quality might be applied within project management, this uh, from Project Management Institute and, and uh, when most companies that look at large capital investments, there is a, a capital management process and, and phases where a project goes through opportunity identification, generating, uh, selecting alternatives, uh, selecting your development and doing the, the front-end engineering, executing and operating. And if you think about in these, these phases where value potential could, could lie, in the early part, we have a typical project value potential pathway. As you're thinking about your opportunity and what the choices are, you increase value potential, and then after you select and, and move towards operation, you hope that you could execute well and not erode value. However, if you think in the early parts of, of this process, using business acumen, understanding your value drivers and your uncertainties and um, your market, uh, framing your problem more, more, uh, more thoughtfully and, and having good divergent thinking about alternatives, you can generate a lot more value potential in the front end of your projects so that then when you do decide and, and you manage to maintain your value, you've, you've set yourself in a place that you wouldn't have been if you just got your first answer and then tried to execute away. Because even if you think, oh, I'm a great executing company, um, I'll get a lot of value out of that, exceptional execution will not close the value potential gap that you could have achieved with enough of a step back um, strategic pause think about your value drivers and your possibilities more rather than say here's an answer that works think about what answers might be better and so 
while that sounds like okay well i know we all want to get going fast and 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 uh, and execute our projects um the decision quality workflow is scalable and powerful and it doesn't have to be um slow and ponderous in fact the frame the the, the parts of of a decision quality workflow can be broken down into three uh, core areas that that's not the full chain, but just think of them simply as frame the problem up front, and then with a well-framed problem, diverge and 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 pull on the organization's creativity, the people you have at, at around around you to come up with creative alternatives that that would meet your framed question, and then ultimately with those choices, you have to converge on on a decision and and go forward. So things to think about in the framing is don't presuppose what the answer is going to be starting off having if you're going to have a decision quality workshop don't come into it with what you think the answer is a solution neutral problem statement is is a a, a really nice way to think about that i'm not going to i'm not going to presuppose what the solution is but i'm going to look at what what the value drivers are um question examples of this how might we get the most value out of the x resource or how might we exploit a certain market opportunity? What might make me happiest in work-life balance, or how would this opportunity advance our strategy? From there, you can think about what would would success. How would success be defined? Well, if you're bringing this to a decision maker and the stakeholders, what are what are their motivations? What are their most important value metrics? What's what is the scope of the problem you're trying to solve and the issues you should you should consider? And then, what are the ways that you might be successful? You can summarize it really as thinking, where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how would we get there in a traditional way? If you apply a little bit more decision quality workflow, you could change that to where are we now? Where could we go? What are the ways we could get there? And then what are the trade-offs of the options? And which one would be best? So hopefully we'll be able to generate a little bit more value potential with just that little bit of a mindset shift. So then walking through the different parts of a decision quality workflow in the frame, here's where we talk about the scope, the definition, the decision metrics, and the issues and constraints and uncertainties. Here's where we do a situation analysis of, of our problem. We can, we can explore that, that space with things like the five whys, why are we doing it, why are we doing it now, et cetera. It's a strategic pause to make sure we've got alignment before we launch into um, construction and execution mode. When we think about issues, there's a, we can break down issues to those that are in our control or those that are not in, in our control, just things we need to consider with this, with this decision. Things that are not our, in our control, well, will they be known at the decision time? In that case, they're a fact. If they're unknown at the decision time, they're an uncertainty. We can also decide what are the things that are, we're going to decide on. What, is our, what are our decision metrics and how are they prioritized? And then finally, we get to what are the decisions, things that are in our control. These are our strategies that are that are the makeup of our, our decisions, our, our choices, not the scenarios of the uncertainties and things that could play out down the road. The decisions can break can be broken down into what we refer to as a decision hierarchy. At the top, you have made decisions basically strategic imperatives that you won't be talking about really they're givens that, that that you come into the project like we're we have a development we're not going to flare gas that is something that as a company policy we won't do um you can get down to the bottom where a lot of the decisions are, are made um as tactical and details and perhaps those are deferrable because what we really want to focus on are these in the middle the focus on key decisions that we really need to set direction on. Okay, so getting started is really important. A, frame, a properly framed problem can get you so far down the road in, in, in the right path. And then you can actually have a touchstone that allows divergent thinking to come into play and the creative options and scenarios and alternatives that could still meet your framed objectives. This is where you bring out your facilitation toolkit and you look at issue trees and mind mapping and uh, ask questions, probing questions where 
facilitators, trained facilitators, can draw the most out of your your organization, asking questions, probing questions like, okay, how else might we meet the frame objective? We've got an answer, but that's let's let's push it a little, push the boundaries a little bit further, and see how we can break the problem apart even more. One one tool that's that's a powerful way to do this and, and to, to separate out and distinguish your choices is a strategy table. Now, strategies, as I say, are a collection of our choices and they have objectives and a rationale. For example, you may just have a development strategy of, well, I've got an asset or a market opportunity, I could go big. And the objective is I wanna maximize my, uh, my value potential here and the rationale is this is this is a great opportunity so we should we should try to get the most out of it um, we may say that there's a strategy of lightning we want to be uh, fastest to market because market capture is the most important thing not necessarily getting the biggest part of the market because more of the value is in speed to market and and getting that most profitable front end we may say, well, there's a lot of uncertainty out here. Let's have, let's take an Icarus. We don't want to fly too close to the sun. Uh, we could get in trouble, so we want to take it slow and, and, and cautiously. With the strategies, you have choices that, that you, can, uh, you can select. For example, in this, if we were thinking about a, a plant or something, we've got a product choice, location, size, and, and processes that we may want to use. And each one of these may be more or less attuned to the different strategies, objectives, and rationales. So as we connect the dots of these different strategy options, we have narratives. For example, a, a, a cautious narrative may only say, we're only doing one product, we're doing it in a safe location, we're making it small and only and, and not overcomplicating things. Or a big strategy may be, multiple options in uh, in one location, but with multiple processes to try to get the most bang for the buck. When it comes down to those those kind of options that are that are defined, then we have to make a decision. And different companies do different uh, decision processes. Some have decision review boards. Um, there may be just a single manager who has most of the authority. Um, we may look at a multi-attribute, multi-objective decision model or analytics that basically indicate with all the analysis we've done, this looks like the best choice. But usually there's no easy button when it comes to making a decision. There may be voting that, that uh, has to happen and then you've got group dynamics to think about. And the group dynamics question <clears throat> in a voting sense, <clears throat> wisdom of the crowds, is also where uh, there's potential for artificial intelligence assistance. I'm gonna show you a, uh, a demonstration of one type of artificial intelligence called Swarm that's uh, put out by Unanimous AI. And this example is one where a group of people were debating what would be the most like, who is most likely to win best picture in uh, 2017, I believe it was. And you can see that it starts off with a lot of people have a diversion of diversity of opinions, but then um, the the crowd sees that one side is winning more than the other. Um, it's anonymous and and truly captures the, the sentiment of the group. And you can actually see whether there were you know how close things might might have been. But ultimately, it it really captures the wisdom of the crowd in this swarm technology that birds. Uh, flocking birds and, and schools of fish used to go in the right direction, in the best direction. So just a, a, a potential future direction in, in decision-making that technology can help with. Now, one of the reasons why decisions making is hard is because the, the reason why we're making decision is as a competition. Um, competing decision metrics are, are for every project are, are common and the choices that you make to prioritize really define your strategy. You may say, um, I wanna maximize my net present value. Well, maximizing net present value may come at a cost of efficiency. We experienced that in unconventionals 
pre-pandemic when there was so much drilling trying to capture lots of value, but inefficiently developing some of the some of the assets. And you're seeing a lot of the unconventional players pull back from from pursuit of pure NPV in favor of a more efficient approach. Um, resiliency against low low price low cost uh, break even uh, low prices could wreck your portfolio or pursuit of ESG environmental societal and governance issues where a lot of the the carbon capture and and uh, um, pivot to to green technology space is and the decisions that are being made with prioritizing these these metrics uh, is really critical to the success of, of a company we've probably all seen um, a few years back in 2021 bp and shell and some of the european majors sensed a, a, a tide shift towards more esg and gambled big on a fast transition from oils to renewables and i don't need to show the, what the stock performance was for bp and, and some of the others to show that the market didn't really appreciate that and had the, the companies have since shifted back to uh, a more traditional portfolio with you know keeping an eye on ESG issues but what's been known by uh, decision makers in the oil and gas industry for a long time is there's not a shortage of oil out there it's a it's it's a shortage of profitable oil and uh, attractive oil barrels that we can produce competitively into the market according to these metrics so studies have been done on that looking at how much oil and gas has been produced or, or is available in in the world and how it might look relative to a couple of those those metrics the break-even price and emissions intensity as a as a new uh, a new metric for uh, governing how companies want to portray their portfolio if you have a vision of a strategy that that has a scenario where oil price remains high and uh, emissions are not that serious you might want to pursue some of these option opportunities that are further to the right and there this disadvantaged space there are still very large accumulations out there that may not make it to market because they're high carbon intensity and high cost so portfolios are focused on these advantaged assets where can i get a low break-even cost and a low emissions intensity and where you put that line, your your investment cutoff is again uh, a function of how you see the future and the strategic optionality you want to maintain. Having decision quality in the mix will help you sort through what some of those choices are and what some of the scenarios that have signposts and mitigations might might influence how you you make up your portfolio mix. Now, if we think about assets. Um, and, and what goes into a, a portfolio, we want to be aware of the value drivers and um, and the uncertainties. Um, here's a, a field offshore in Norway, Johan Kasseberg has a high quality geophysical anomaly, um, but it also has good fiscals. In Norway, it, uh, even though the government take is high, the break even price is low. If this same field had been in the United Kingdom with recent uh, fiscal changes, it would make a lot more value uh, NPV per BOE for the for the contractor. Now it, it could be the other way around. The same field could have been in Egypt, where the the government take is higher and the break even cost is higher and, and less attractive. And we're a lot of us are familiar with that that scenario in oil and gas, but it also applies to um, alternative energy and and uh, wind power, for example. Here's a a map of, of wind speeds, average wind speeds, and you can see the purples are, are higher, the, the yellows are lower. So geographically, there's a part of the country which is has a more favorable um, resource base, if you will, and it coincides with where the highest amount of installed capacity um, on wind electricity is. But it says it's not something that is available everywhere. Likewise, in the uh, the power generation space um, and carbon capture and sequestration, which is where a lot of the oil companies have been pivoting to, we have new policy changes that have, have incentivized investments in, in different places. And what used to have, used to have gas supply coming into 
uh, gas turbines and those with combined cycle that generated CO2 that you could capture and sequester. And the previous credits of $50 a ton now have been increased to $85 a ton uh, for sequestered CO2, incentivizing some investments that way. But even more so, the new player is hydrogen on the in the in the um, investment opportunity space. So hydrogen burns cleanly with no CO2 emissions. Um, ways you can get hydrogen are through taking in the gas and methane supply, reforming it and capturing the CO2, or using green energy from wind and solar and electro electrolyzers in water to generate the hydrogen. So this is the so-called blue versus green hydrogen uh, choices. And if you look at what the uncertainties are there, the biggest one is how uh, expensive is your renewable power price. If it's high, which currently, currently can be, it's depending on where you are, um, there's a cost advantage for blue. And also, if methane price is low, then that's the other big driver. Methane price is high, renewable power low, advantage green, otherwise advantage to blue. And then most of the other things are not are not major value drivers. Secondly, we can look at one we're very familiar with as uh, an offshore oil development. We've got a gas field, oil and gas field, and, and we're trying to diverge on concept selection. We can look at these different development concepts of uh, tieback, fixed platform, semi-submersible. And if we look at measure economic me measures of, of net present value and efficiency they plot in different parts of the field if you look at this and you say i want to maximize my npv and my uh my efficiency it's an easy button let's go for six wells tie back but it's not that easy when you look at what some of the analysis is required to to make a better decision um the study that's been that was done uh, Rodrigo Sanchez et al. in 2012, looking at this, breaking down a, a multiple objective, multiple attribute decision model, different attributes of, of favorability are scored. And in this case, uh, not just net present value, but operability, fabrication, time to first production, reliability. And operability actually was weighted by the panel of experts looking at it as the highest value. Different choices that may not it may not distinguish between a fixed platform and a floating system, but if you it does distinguish between the tieback. But as you thought, as you saw a tieback having the, the highest MPV, time to first production and cost is is the preferred choice. Now, with these these numbers and, and this kind of analysis, you can also look at a range of uh, of distributions and seeing a, a high and low and base case. With all this data that's 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 available, it's possible to build probabilistic models and uh, in a multi-attribute decision model where you can see the different options for development and and the distribution of uncertainty in uh, against these the scoring of multi-attributes, uh, the multi-attribute decision model. When you plot those those uh, cases, you may see that in terms of net present value against uh, a risk value, risk weight, tieback scores highest in, in net present value. But if you look at what the multiple attributes that, that go into your decision, the fixed platform option is the highest. And you can see too, from a decision maker's perspective, the range of uncertainty associated with the tieback value and the subsea value is much greater. The fixed platform is a much tighter distribution, so a decision maker can have higher confidence that they are. Uh, they will achieve what what they've, they've they've set out with. Those ranges of uncertainty with different decision con uh, decision uh, or development concepts um, allows us to do some more decision quality work and, and scenario thinking, which is different than setting uh, than opening the aperture up. We're actually thinking about um, predetermining that the project failed. And then thinking about how did it fail? When did we know it was doomed? How could we have pivoted? Could we have captured more value? Here we look at our choices and the range of expected values. They may closer pretty closely, so it may not be very obvious how to distinguish between these these projects. We may be able to look at what 
an investment case, cumulative cash flow for any one option looks like. And then imagine scenarios where we're ahead of schedule, have lower cost, better performance for more value. Um, and then all these other cases that may be less value, delay, higher cost, average performance, underperformance, early abandonment, or my favorite government and commercial reset, higher cost and underperformance all, all told. So how do we how do we prepare for this? Well, benchmarking against other projects that look similar to this and being aware of of how things projects could fail, and then looking for um, what what do those share, what does our project share in common for that? We may be able to spend a little money and and get value of information to minimize some of the uncertainty in a given development project uh, concept. With a little bit of positive information, we may be able to limit or reduce the, the downside or with negative information we may be able to say the the upside is 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 gone with some of these uncertainties we can pursue real options space where we we put some money down and pre-invest in case bad things happen uh, we may or may not take those real options but we're really thinking about mitigatable risk and what are the signposts that that would allow us to to see and avoid or respond quickly to uh, to those different scenarios. When we think about how this applies to strategy development and, and where the energy system is going, for example, here is ExxonMobil's outlook for energy and the energy mix from oil and natural gas and renewables. Now this is not, this is one, one option. And if you did this, you would say, well, let's keep investing in natural gas, which is what ExxonMobil is doing. But if you look at a range of scenarios that others have published on what the energy mix in 2050 will be, you can see that there's a very distinct slant to where ExxonMobil thinks it is relative to what a bunch of other scenarios do. And that's an analysis of what we think, or ExxonMobil thinks, the policy, consumer preferences, and technology development will be to see which, which of these strategies they should pursue across the next 30 years. All right. So with that, I'd like to turn it over then to Amalia um, to walk us through another example here in the case study. Thanks, Jack. So following uh, with the same train of thought that Jack has walked us through, I thought I'd share some ex uh, examples from my experience where we as a group, as a management team, had to face very difficult decisions. And we used a similar thought process to uh, you know, to come to an option. And uh, we can actually, given that I've been, uh, you know, I've done, made these decisions with the team about two or three years ago, we can see how things are playing out given the choices that were made. So I thought that was a, an interesting uh, example to share. So we'll talk about an explorer company that is quite bold and it was facing a very uh, deep crisis. Uh, financial crisis internally, plus uh, COVID times crisis with low oil prices. So the initial frame, the initial question that was posed to me as head of exploration is, you know, how do we maintain exploration alive? And that was a question from my team. And the question from my, um, you know, executive management was, how can we kill exploration? The faster, the better. So that was kind of the position that I was in. Um, and with a little bit of um, it's just real deep thought uh, and you know talking to some colleagues is the question really wasn't any of those two questions. We don't need to keep exploration alive or kill it. We need to understand what does a company need from exploration given the situation it's in. So the reframing piece was essential, especially to open the conversation with senior management to explore some options rather than to make the fast decision to let's just go kill it. Uh, or to appeal to the instinct of the team of let's just stay alive, whatever it takes. Um, so framing, I think it's a, this is a really good example of reframing to get to a productive conversation. Um, in terms of the divergent options, and once we were able to, okay, let's look at what decisions we could make, um, let's just um, run some models of what the company uh, cash flows and growth would look like with no exploration. Uh, we also thought, well, we can look at ILX exploration exclusively. Uh, another choice was to keep exploring at a very slow pace, you know, 
one well every year or two and you know see if we get lucky at some point um the third the fourth option was a combination of two or three some ilx some slow pace um you know see how we we can figure out with that and finally with the well maybe a combination of two and three so having some exploration at slow pace because that's what the budget allowed I have in, um, some ILX in, in exploring around the fields, plus doing a little bit of M&A for additional production areas that had more potential for ILX and our you know, assets in our current uh, base um, it was the final thought. And I guess I wanna turn the attention to the picture to the lower right. I think Jack was talking about the competing metrics and the competing metrics were really important for framing this decision in terms of are we looking for company growth how can we uh, stay within the budget and uh, are we able to replace our production and, and be a sustainable company and uh, how do we diversify our portfolio so that we're not um held hostage to a single government or you know put in a position to rely on a single asset so taking into account these four pulling uh, priorities the the converse uh, option that was chosen was option five so some combination of ilx which is limited to the current assets in the in the asset base um exploration at slow pace um which is always a, a, a killer as you don't have enough shots at something to statistically win. Um, and then some attempts for m a which in the times of these decisions were quite difficult with the price of oil being so low and the company financials being weak. Um, so if we look at what played out, um, there's been some exploration in ILX, basically some appraisals in, in small developments within the developed field, and uh, production has increased from you know 70,000 barrels a day to 100,000 barrels a day. So that's been a good use of refocusing the exploration effort in the team into um, getting more out of the assets existing. The same effort has not been um, successful with the non-operated ventures. It's just really hard to align your partners to do exploration in their assets if that's not part of their own drivers. And so some challenges there. And then the M&A uh, opportunities have not come to pass. There have been a couple of attempts and those deals have fell through kind of late in the uh, deal making. Um, but I think this touches on some very real cases that, you know, our team struggle with uh, in the current uh, times. Let me just walk quickly through two other uh, scenarios, which will be shorter. But the next one, uh, thanks, Jack, um, the value drivers on exploration acreage, this is very real. We tend to um, struggle with assigning value to our acreage in terms of our technical value or commercial value. Um, so it's it's always something that needs to be well thought and well discussed with the teams. Technically attractive opportunities, uh, especially when they can be tested by a neighbor operator and depending on the results of that well, you know, you could hit the jackpot or um, your acreage may be worth nothing. And uh, so uh, these are exciting situations that we get ourselves quite uh, quite often in exploration. And then the uh, the trick here was combined with tough commercial terms. So you could have something really valuable that no one would want to step into because the commercial terms of our agreement were quite difficult with carries uh, into several phases and out of reach for the company's uh, context at the time. Um, it was an untested play, non-producing basin. So even if there was success and we could say maybe we can monetize the acreage by farming it out to someone else and getting a couple of million bucks for it, uh, there were many years away from monetization. So the real monetization of the uh, discovery and, and production was just too far away uh, for us to reach. So some of the uh, divergent thoughts that we had at the time was to state and negotiate a delay of the seismic phase kind of buy us some time and uh, at the expense of straining our relationship with the government. 
The second option was to rene renegotiate care with a partner, which had no incentive to renegotiate. Um, the third option was to exit before adjacent driller, drilling and not find out what the acreage was worth. Uh, option four was to farm out and transfer the carry to the new partner, but a new partner would not have the incentive to um, move before the drilling next door. So that was really hard to do. And the option five was to buy out our partner, so get rid of those bad terms and then attempt a farm out for which we didn't have cash. So a number of different options that we entertained here. This is Namibia, uh, Pell 90. So it's just north of the Venus Discovery where my team had to choose option three because of the constraints that we have with the company. Now, are we biting ourselves because we did that? Well, the commerciality of the discovery next door is still to be seen. Um, the opportunity lies in a different play and fairway than Venus. So all the success that Venus is certainly de-risked some of the elements. It doesn't de-risk all the elements of Pell 90. Um, and finally, even if we kept the opportunity, we didn't have the money to come through and, and comply with our obligations. Um, so we would be sitting on something that maybe is nice, but we have no data, but no money to acquire the data. So uh, at this point, we thought we did what we needed to do for our particular circumstances. The final example, and this will be super quick, uh, just to make you think that, that this can be, this frame of decision making can also be applied to other decisions that are perhaps less tangible. In this case, it's a performance uh, issue. And uh, sometimes we think that the initial frame is okay, people that don't perform need to be cut. And the reframing of the situation, because when you cut people that don't perform, you also waste away all the investments you made in terms of developing that person, uh, having them know the organization be effective in a number of ways and training and all kinds of things where you actually had a uh, significant investment. Uh, but a more productive frame is how do we combine the talents of the team to allow collaboration? And uh, in this example, um, I came into a team where I was warned of a low performer and was able to um, convert this person into a super mentor with very young staff working with him who had lots of ideas, but little incentives to get things done or, or little um, self-drive to get things done. But having a whole host of mentees to work with, his ideas were really interesting and useful and productive, and he could get lots of hands working in the right direction. Um, so framing also works for these types of decisions. Um, with that, let me pass it on to Jack. Great. Thanks, Amalia. Those are great. So to summarize what we were thinking about in terms of decision quality takeaways and business risks and uncertainties, identifying issues, signposts, and mitigations are, are, are key. So when we think about technical quality, we can look at data collection as signposts, whether we get good news or bad news, the value of information to collect that that uh, that data and then modify your development concepts as a mitigation. Geopolitically, if you have policy incentives, monitor the political landscape and then scenario model alternate fiscals and design flexibility. We're thinking about technology and competition. We try to follow what technology developments are and maybe participate in field, field trials. As a mitigation, we might want to incentivize measured adoption and react to the success or failure of, of adopting new technology. Thinking about consumer demand and prices, again, monitoring geopolitical and economic trends and maintain portfolio resilience with the flexibility to capture upsides in the energy transition. This is one of the major drivers is how consumer demand for hydrogen and, and uh, decarbonization will, will play out. We need to think about the supply chain. Critical minerals is an example of construction and, op and operational costs. Again, monitoring the, mar the market, benchmarking against similar types of projects or, or signposts, seeking alternative suppliers and thinking ahead, doing a little pre-mortem thinking of, of how we can, we can protect ourselves. Energy security is certainly a big one and, and, and uh, has changed recently with, with 
developments in Russia and other places. So you want to identify and monitor some of those geopolitical risks, and again, diversify your portfolio for alternate scenarios. And most importantly, the economics of your project and investment reappraisal. What did you think the project was going to do going in and how did it actually perform? Where you really critically must examine your assumptions and especially your decision processes. Were biases, biases uh, prevalent in decisions we made that may have led to underperformance of projects? Very important to check on that and then try to try to, to adjust accordingly. Our key decision to quality takeaways here, a decision quality approach, frame, diverge, converge is simple, scalable, and powerful. In the energy industry, success is going to require strategic choices in the face of transition. A decision quality approach brings structure and tools to help. An example that I'm showing here in the bottom is the stock performance of Chevron versus ExxonMobil over the last 20 years. And Chevron has been an early adopter of a decision quality approach. They've, they've led the industry in that, uh, being close to um, California and Stanford business schools, they um, made it a strong part of their culture. ExxonMobil had looked at some of their decisions some, that would admittedly made with biases, and in 2018 modified some of their decision making processes to to follow more decision quality. And as you can see, the the performances have uh, rebalanced themselves. And in fact, I think ExxonMobil may be leading um, in most recently. So. Having a, a change in your decision making is 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 really critical. Scenarios that focus on pre-mortem signposts and mitigable uncertainty can guide decision making in, in great uncertainty. And this is the the SPE technical report I mentioned earlier, it's 2016, about guidance for decision quality in multi-company upstream projects. Finding that common ground, um, because truly framing the problem correctly, the right questions and the right metrics is really critical to achieving better decisions and better results. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions and give it back to Susan for to moderate the, the questions that come in. Thank you, Jack. Just a reminder, uh, you are muted if you're in the audience, but you can ask questions using the GoToWebinar question feature and you will be anonymous. So talk about the challenge of uh, paralysis of analysis. It seems like oftentimes we get stuck in this loop where we're studying so many variables and we can't make a decision. How do we uh, move forward? We usually think that more analysis will get us there, right? I think uh, stepping back and and really forcing a team to generate alternatives and, and understand the trade-offs is a good way to get past that that at some point you're not you you're you're grinding on junk you're not adding more value by doing more analysis the decision should be framed and taken to a, to a decision maker with you know a clear understanding of what trade-offs they are faced with and if there are, are signposts and mitigations that you you uh, have thought through so that the decision maker may not feel so exposed they may say Okay, we're keeping an eye on these, these signposts ahead, and the project team has thought if things turn out differently than we thought our investment basis was, we we've thought about how we can we can mitigate and um, reduce some of the risk or or capture some of the upside. Thank you, Amalia. Did you want to add to that? Avoiding yeah. the paralysis of analysis. Yeah. No, I think it's just. Uh, I think J uh, Jack covered it in the first slide with Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, quote that if those things that have little relevance or are reversible, uh, those you shouldn't paralyze yourself too much because you can undo them later. Or you know, if you make a mistake, um, there's there's not a high price. So it's distinguishing what is it that you can move fast through versus what requires uh, an analysis. And, and much of it is in the reframing. Sometimes the reframing enables you to go through that second piece real quick. Um, so even thinking that you're gonna go down the path of analyzing, um, all it takes is the first step to realize what way you should go. Thank you. 
Jack, on, on slide 10, you referred to multi-attribute, multi-objective analysis. And I, I think you provided an example, but how do you calculate those? How, how do you make those calculations? Yeah, so that's really where expert judgment comes in and subject matter experts to do the analysis that's required to, um, to really communicate the trade-offs. And, you know, at the end of the day, you can argue with, a, with an expert opinion. Um, that's why some of the probabilistic analysis may be useful in that because it may not be one, that was, there were some very uh, precise numbers given for, for the value breakdown and the weighting of the different components that the experts provided. But thinking about those in terms of a, you know, a, a distribution of uncertainty and whether that distribution is skewed, are there, are there key signposts that, you know, if I can't get access to a, to a wet tree, that, that really makes it much, much harder. Um, and, and, you know, how you quantify that is, is expert judgment. And Amalia, how do you make these calculations but still avoid bias? Uh, oftentimes our experts are internal company experts and, and how can you be objective about their the decisions that they're recommending? I, I think going back to the framework that Jack proposed, it's understanding what are those few value drivers and having those really clear and agreed upon the greater group and not just by a single expert. Um, that I think is one of the most important elements if we agree what is it that we're chasing and what are our competing metrics and value drivers. Um, and then the second piece is understanding your constraints. What is it that you cannot do? And understanding your uncertainties. What is it that you don't know and it's gonna be out of your control? And, Having those clear in front, I think, removes most of the intangible bias. The other piece is once you get into the things you know, you're going to have ways to evaluate those um, more precisely and more objectively have data to support them. I think the greatest biases are on the risk and uncertainty side and in a disagreement of what is the drivers. And, and that's why my answer. Thank you. Jack, you showed a, a example from, I think it was the Academy Awards with the Swarm technology. It mm -hmm. reminds me of that classic book, The Wisdom of Crowds. So, exactly. so tell me more about um, this crowd think, uh, being able yeah. to harness the power of a crowd. Well, so Wisdom of the Crowds works great if there is no, if it's completely unbiased, which, you know, anytime you, you say, if, if you've been in a wisdom of the crowds kind of a, a setting, yellow sticky goes up and people watch what the boss does. And then, oh, that's a great idea. I think that that's a wisdom of the crowds there. Um, what this technology does, it, this there's a swarm algorithm, which has has been published for some time. And this, this technology the, that unanimous AI puts out will, uh, it actually has been used in sports betting with significantly better performance against uh, against the line. You know, just gathering up people who know, have general general opinions on on the subject and, and you know, you can be influenced by um, how the crowd is voting and and you can see how strong some of the sentiments are for, for alternate choices that you may want to pursue and check out, but, this is a it's a true measure of of what the swarm what the flock thinks is you know where, how, how do we avoid prey or the, where the hawks are and uh, you know in in how to, in uh, awards or betting you know how, how does everybody think you know truly is that a good line who's going to win so it is the best way to to capture in my experience to capture a true wisdom of the crowds thank you uh, amalia you talked about sometimes the challenge of aligning partners in, in OJV assets with your strategy. Um, what are some uh, decision quality approaches you can use to influence your partners? That's a really good question, Susan. Um, I think there's uh, some good ways to put, uh, follow a methodical approach to JV partners. And um, 
part of it is understanding what value you bring to the table and understanding what value the operator or the rest of the JV brings to the table. Then um, putting together a proposition for making sure that the value you bring to the table is heard and some of it is in a conversation of um, looking at the JV as a true partnership versus uh, I will replicate all your work and make sure that you're doing what you need to do is more on the basis of I trust you in these things and I have expertise in these other things and I'd like to bring those for the benefit of the JV. Um, Next step is to put a plan together to deliver that value and have the right communications strategically planned to uh, ensure that the JV is aware of what you can bring to the table. Um, and then finally, having an alignment of the drivers of all the partners um, articulated out on the table. Um, sometimes we tend to assume that those conversations are outside the JV, they're too big, they're confidential, we can't really share what other driver's companies have, or we don't want to share our driver, you know, uh, and lose competitive advantage. And many times we, by using those techniques, we get stuck. So those are some ways where I think, you know, JV uh, partnerships can be managed a little more productively. That's great. I think we have time for one more question. Our, our listener says, I think it's really important to remember some of the biggest oil and gas discoveries were not crowdfunded in many instances. They were discovered by the outliers in the discussion, the contrarians. Any comments from either of you? I think that just uh, illustrates how much divergence is so needed and how much slow pace exploration does not work. Because if you stick to just what you one shot a year, you're not going to do any of the outliers. If you have a program that enables that mix, um, then you'll hit those discoveries. I fully agree. Great comment. I'd say it's better look better to be lucky than good. However, <laughs> if you uh, like like uh, uh, I don't know who, which golfer it was that said, you know, the more I practice, the luckier I get. And the more you use a, a better decision quality approach um, on a portfolio basis, every decision isn't going to be going to be great, but on on average, it should be better than the alternatives. Excellent. So thanks for attending today's webinar. Later today, you'll receive a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to SCA's website with more information about our business advisory services provided by Dr. Olivia Riley for SEA, including those related to asset value optimization, organizational efficiency, non-operator influence, strategy, and transformation. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody.